Uh, I'm Catherine Garcia. I'm a lifelong New Yorker. I love this city and I'm running for New York City mayor to make it a more livable uh, place for our families. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Uh, we have lots of folks who really care about early ed um, and so um, we're glad to make this a part of the conversation in the race. Um, so diving right into it, uh, we're expecting an influx of federal resources focusing on early education and child care issues. Um, and so the first question I have for you is how would you prioritize using more money to build and strengthen the system that we have now? There are lots of decisions to made about expansion versus maybe quality improvements in what we already have. So how are you thinking about investing those resources? Oh, uh, no, the, the American Rescue Plan is going to be a game changer for Americans across the country and for families uh, because one of the hardest things for any family is having the resources for really strong early childhood care and education. And my priority has been that we need to ensure that for those who make less than $70,000, that they have free childcare available from zero to three. Um, because we know these are sort of the most critical times for brain development. Uh, and you need every kid ready for school. But it also fundamentally is about families and being able to go to work. And particularly for women, we know that one in four women has stepped back from work because they couldn't manage the pandemic and work and childcare. I want to dig in a little deeper into your plan for free childcare for children from now you're saying birth to three, right? I think your website says one to three. So that's good to know because currently I think services start at six weeks. So you would start it as soon as birth? Yes. Well, we, we want to give mom a little bit of a chance to bond, but yes. Well. Okay, so good to know. Um, okay, so your plan calls for free child care uh, for children from zero to three uh, for families making less than $70,000 a year. How much capacity would be needed for that and where and how would you add it? We have a system that is very fragmented with you know, community-based organizations, public schools, that sort of thing. Yes, uh, the, the early childhood has not been, I'd say, a social priority in this country where it is in many other countries. And when you look at this, we have to be able to accommodate what parents' choices are going to be. So there are parents who are going to want a more family daycare system, or they are going to want uh, more DOE-like systems, or they are going to want more of a Montessori-type system. And we have to build out the plan to make sure that we are accommodating all of that choice. And this means that not only are we gonna build capacity uh, as the government, but also thinking about how do you ensure that there are just vouchers for people to be used at what we already have, and that we are ensuring that those are continuing to strengthen as we move forward. And so it is a plan that is multi-pronged and needs to move forward in a way that ensures that we are working with families to get them what they need. Um, and so I know that, that this is going to be challenging. It is always challenging rolling out new programs, but we're really excited about getting to start that on day one. So you mentioned vouchers. There's a backlog of families waiting to get uh, approval for vouchers, income certification, that sort of thing. And meanwhile, providers say that they have slots that are going empty. So I'd love to hear what is your diagnosis of what the problem is there and how would you solve that? There, there is a real challenge with getting vouchers that we currently have into the hands of people who need it so that they can actually fill up the vacant slots that are available today. Uh, this is just government bureaucracy run amok. And I find this over and over again, particularly on the social services side, we don't think about the person or the family like as like, what is the outcome we wanna see? We want that family to be strong. So what do they need? Do they need a voucher? Do they need um, 
you know, help finding a job? Do they need help finding affordable housing? Uh, and really putting it all together into a package so you're not going agency to agency, but this is just um, creating barriers to a service that we want people to have. And what does removing those barriers look like? Do you have any specific ideas? Yeah, so why do you need to get income certified in every single moment when you're interacting with the government? Uh, when we probably already know what your income is, uh, that we should use the information that we already have uh, to make it so that we can fill in most of what this is uh, and turn make it so that you can turn the timing really quickly to get the work done and so that we're not spending our time filling out forms, but spending our time making sure a kid is in that early childhood placement. So it sounds like streamlining, not making people answer the same question lots of different times over and over again. Over and over. When it comes to accessibility, a lot of working families rely on programs that go beyond the normal school day and school year. Uh, providers say that there are not enough of these slots, though. Uh, so do you have an opinion on whether there are enough extended school day and school year slots or whether that should be universal? And, and if we do need to expand, how much? What would that look like? So in this particular moment of COVID, when we know that there is real educational need and we have people who are trying to make a living and come back, early childhood and actually just regular school age kid, after school programs and summer programs are absolutely critical. Um, obviously this changes from a young kid to an older kid where we might be talking much more about an internship. Uh, and this is where the American Rescue Plan money can actually be helpful in terms of using it to expand the number of slots, catch people up. We have so many really fabulous nonprofits who do a lot of this work already, uh, but ensuring that it is more universally available. It had been available to all middle school children, um, but not available to all elementary. And then obviously high school is, is a sort of different model, I would say. And this is where I really look to places like Here to Hear, which is doing braided learning and introducing uh, work experience into the high school experience so that kids really have an idea about what the work world will look like and why they wanna make sure that if that's what direction you wanna go in, that you're able to pursue your uh, dreams through uh, higher education. What about for preschool and, and childcare specifically? There are programs that offer extended day and extended school year. Do you think those should be universally available? Oh, no, those need to be available to anyone who, who needs it to support them being able to go to work. Uh, you know, that is primarily the role of those. And certainly uh, it is something that I leaned on when I had very young children. Uh, turning to the workforce in the early education sector, um, we know that the early education workforce is predominantly women, predominantly women of color. The city has made strides in raising uh, salaries so that there is something more approaching parity to teachers in the public school system and in the K-12 system. However, teachers in special education programs are still making significantly less. Uh, and teachers who have been in community-based programs for a long time, um, there are no longevity or seniority um, uh, plans to catch those teachers up. So what is your plan to address salary, salary equity in early child care and education space? And do you have a timeline for that? So this is, this is where you know, we have not as a society treated child care as actually something that was a valuable work experience uh, and have systematically paid usually women less uh, for doing that most critical work. And this is where you have to sit down. Many of them actually do have union representation to make it so that there is a pathway towards equity on salary. 
this is about ensuring also that we are getting the quality we need uh, in early childhood educators. And so I am a big believer in making sure that we are creating a more equitable environment for everyone so that everyone can thrive. So it sounds like this is on your radar and an, and an issue that you want to work on, but do you have a timeline to do that in or any idea of what it would take to get there? Yeah, you have to sit down with the union and go through uh, step by step what those, how you do that. There are ways to do equity adjustments uh, within the framework of pattern bargaining, uh, but it has to be done at the table. Okay. Um, so we touched a little bit on after school and summer programming, which are really important for working families and have been a lifesaver for a lot of families now with lots of school shutdowns due to COVID cases, that sort of thing. Um, but at the same time, a lot of these services are trapped in what advocates call the budget dance, where um, it's yearly, it's something that they have to fight for yearly. Um, so are there programs that you think should be permanently funded that are not currently funded? And if so, which ones are they? Well, I, w I would actually say, so the, the question here is uh, permanently funded versus not permanently funded. Vers that it's, that has nothing to do with whether it's these or anything else. Nothing is ever permanent unless you actually do it every year. Um, and I have been on the cutting room floor uh, on programs that I thought were permanent. Uh, so, you know, this is where it is an ongoing commitment that you need to be making uh, so that we are having a budget that reflects our values and that we have a budget that we know we need to go upstream and make investments in people and particularly our children uh, so that they can thrive in the future. Otherwise you pay for it in the long term. People don't do well in their careers. Uh, you know, parents have trouble getting to work. So this is where it, is, it needs to be something that we fundamentally all agree on, needs to get funded every single year. And this is also about working with the private sector. You know, one thing that often has been, uh, I was sort of a bit of a political football has been summer youth employment. Uh, we need to be working with the private sector as well to make sure that there are paid internships for high school students. I wanted to ask specifically about SYUP. Do you think there are enough seats? Um, and if not, what do we need to get to? So I, I think that we need to make sure that it is available to anyone who wants it, but that we also are doing this in a way where we are engaging not only in the nonprofit sector, but also in the private sector uh, to get there. Um, we need to make sure there are paid internships so that people have real experience, and particularly for those who are going to actually either have to make their own money uh, to pay for their education or have to make their own money to help their families. Uh, we can't just have it so that internships are something that you need to be able, uh, that are free, that you are, you are using free labor. We need to make sure that these are paid, uh, thoughtful opportunities for our youth. I want to ask a kind of big picture question. We've seen enrollment in New York City Public Schools dip. Uh, we've seen that pre-K has had a an especially big drop. I think it's around 13% this year. Um, understanding that you're not going to be the mayor uh, leading up to this next school year, what do you think the city could or should be doing right now to build confidence uh, among families to send their kids back to school? Uh, the city has seen a significant dip in enrollment uh, for next for the next school year. Uh, you know, my biggest concern is um, not only people having confidence in the public school system, but also my concern is we've lost track of kids, uh, that they're not somewhere else that they haven't chosen a different school, but they are just not in school at all. Um, and, you know, when we think about what has happened to kids over this last year and parents, oh goodness gracious, parents, uh, uh, trying to manage Zoom school and openings and closings and the, the 
a two positive requirement and then it has been really so incredibly challenging for them. Uh, that is a loss of confidence. They need to know that you will be consistently there to educate their child. Uh, and the back and forth between Zoom and not Zoom, or what I find even possibly worse is Zoom in the room, where you go to school, but you still do Zoom. Um, that is, I find really, really problematic. Uh, schools need to open strongly this fall. Kids need to be back in their classrooms. There needs to be consistency. Uh, there needs to be more clarity. There cannot be this open close every other second. Uh, it just doesn't work. I mean, as a working mom, it was hard to balance in non-COVID times, school and work and and making sure you, you got the lunches done in the morning. Um, this is where we need them to be as good as some of the other people who provide education have been better at. I mean, I just, you know, the Catholic schools opened and stayed open uh, for the entire year. We should have been able to do that. Are there things specifically that you think the city needs to communicate or change around, for example, its closure protocols or its scheduling for next year that parents need to hear now to know that they'll have that consistency next year? They need, they need to have, have a very clear plan uh, that shows that they are going to be open uh, for business as usual, but with additional support for kids coming back uh, from, in some cases, perhaps more than a year of uh, remote learning, so that they are going to be in vibrant school communities again has to be something that we say we are absolutely committed to making that happen uh, because otherwise we will lose so much of these children's life. What I realize is that, um, you know, my six-year-old niece has spent more than 20% of her life in a pandemic. That is completely bananas. Um, and there's so much that she has not had an opportunity to do and learn uh and you know she's super smart she's i'm sure she'll be fine but uh she really needs interaction with other little kids she needs to be sitting there thinking about uh how how what a line what, what a letter sound like um so it is it is she's got to have a strong first grade year next year that's got to happen so my last question is, segregation in the K-12 space is getting a lot of attention in New York City schools, but pre-K classrooms are also very starkly segregated. And I'm wondering if you think there's anything in particular the city could or should be doing to address that in early education. Well, I, am, I have said from the beginning that uh, we should not have four-year-olds taking a test for gifted and talented. Um, and we need to make it so that every classroom is available to every kid and that there shouldn't, you should be wanting to go to your local elementary school. Uh, you know, I didn't think about where I was gonna send my kids. I just sent them up the block. Uh, Cause I knew that I was like, this is a good school. They'll be fine. Uh, and then I think as you think about it, as you're going into obviously middle school, things change, but there's no reason we should have uh, real segregation at that young level because it's also, in many cases, not even um, geographically focused. You know, there are big pods of preschool classrooms like all in one building um, because that's the way it rolled out. But this is where we need to make sure that we are giving everyone equal access uh, to the preschool of their choice. So I wanna give you the chance to touch on anything that maybe we haven't discussed specific in the early education, child care, aftercare world. Is there anything that you think is really important that people know about? Uh, I think this is, this is gonna be a really challenging 
year for all of our kids. Uh, and our littlest kids need to make sure that they are having an incredibly enriched experience and that they have art and music and theater and sports and dance available to them so that we are educating the whole child and engaging with that whole child across a broad array of interests uh, because there's been so much isolation that being out in the world and having that social uh, interaction may end up feeling a little shocking to the system and we need to do everything as grown-ups uh, to support them moving forward.